I'm going to go to 116, and we're going to do one of them just to, for the similarity, but aside from that, and by the way, prior to test, somebody needs to tell me what's pass fail on that box. All right? Did it pass? Well, what's my susceptibility indications? You should know that. In your procedure, if you don't have what's pass fail, then why are you doing the test? Okay? Stop and think about it. Can I allow a 10% variance? We had somebody recently come up with the current meter is allowed to vary 25 amps. Okay? 25 amp variance on a current meter? Okay. Then they set a load current of 6 amps. All right, now how am I going to know if it changed by 25? It goes, has to go below zero? No, that's not going to happen. So I says, you have to adjust the load current where I can see that pass fail. Now, if it had never moved, that's one thing. But guess what? Two minutes into the test, it was all over the place. And I didn't know whether it did or not. So you got to put enough current into it so I can see a 25 amp variance. Okay? They were varying almost 20 amps. Okay? So by technical rationale, they pass. But that's a lot of variance on a current meter that's set at 50 amps. Okay? Well, it, was a lot, it could measure 500, so that much of full scale was legit. I look at it and say, if I was a user of this and my current was varying 20 amps out of 50, that would bother me. I wouldn't want that product. So, and guess what? I did the test wrong. I came over here to notice, and I was doing this, and I calibrated with this bridge, and I didn't put it back in during the test. So let's put it back in and see if the waveform looks different. And I guess what? 100, 200, 300, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. 1.8 amps, not 800 milliamps. So I'd injected the wrong current. Okay. Don't be embarrassed when that happens. Just correct it. Okay. Now, take a photograph of the test setup. Okay. Boom. Got a picture. Goes to the report. Jim's reviewing his report. He looks at it and says, uh, the bridge wasn't in. It's got it in the picture. The bridge wasn't installed. The test was done wrong. The unit has been shipped back to California. He doesn't have it. It's 9,600 pounds. He's got to call that client with the mirror test that says, <clears throat> I'm so embarrassed, but I got to look at it and tell you I did the test wrong. So you need to ship that product back to the lab at my expense for me to do a one minute test. <laughs> now that's embarrassing, okay? It is, but guess what is more embarrassing? When the Navy client gets his report and looks at it and says the bridge wasn't there. That's even more, because that's two months later, and now that product is not only back at the other company, it's installed in the ship. Now go get it, okay? That's the hard part. Find it as quick as you can. In-house, we have internal audits. Somebody else looks at the setup and the data before we release it, okay? That unit stays in the configuration until another person audits it. So my auditor hopefully will come in and say, you didn't have that bridge in. I get a chance to redo it real time. I audit myself. I look, oh, wait a minute, wrong, wrong answer, that's there. Stop and do that. We see that we have a different answer. So now let's plug that piece of data in. And I said it was 1.3 amps. So instead of 0.8, I have 1 point, I have 1.05 looks like. So now I injected 4.2 amps, not 1.8. When you start converting these volts into dB and et cetera, it becomes a significant impact. So watch your numbers. They, they can mess with you. I changed the voltage ever so slightly and got a double the current. I didn't double the voltage I measured, but I doubled the current because of the factors. Okay? So be aware that's what we're doing. So I halt that test. By the way, it always gives you that tingly feeling if you disconnect this while it's running, because that pulse wants to get to your fingers. 
It hurts. <laughs> it does hurt. Oh, by the way, we do have this test to do on other cables. I need to do this, since it's an unshielded power cable, I need to do the phase or positive lead only without these other wires. Okay. Would you expect anything different? Maybe. Okay. Let's find out what we got. And note how much lower that current is. It was up here. We're down here now. Okay. Lots of circuit changes here. Does the data make sense? Can I explain why that's acting like it's acting? Why would one lead be less current than the bundle? The ground circuit, the third wire maybe. What's my circuit look like inside? Do I have a short circuit feeding back the loop? So I have a positive to negative loop that's lower impedance, I expect more current. Okay. Nothing bothers me more than to drive an AC power cord into a transformer and I can't produce any current and I expect that. And then the people do it on the phase lead and, and can't get current again and don't understand why. They better because it's a transformer. I've got a short loop. The transformer at this frequency, interwinding capacitance, etc., ought to be such low current. And if it's not, there's a problem. So look at the circuit. Does this data make sense? So I always add that to the equation. Okay. I did go off. So anyway, we would record that data, take our pictures, etc. So now I have that setup completed. And now I'm going to take this same probe. And by the way, in this system, this probe is used for CS115 and the high frequency CS116 without the bridge. So the bridge is out legitimately for this time. Low frequency is that current probe with this system. Okay. So I need to change my modules. You can't even look at the thing, much less talk to it. And I'm going to I'm going to put in the high frequency CS116. Okay, recognize the module change. I was going too quick. I didn't leave it on long enough for it to see it. So now I've got a couple of more waveforms. I'm going to go ahead and go to the 100 megahertz. Air down, 100 megahertz, enter that. And it's set for some voltage. Now I set it for three volts, three amps max. Okay, the waveform for CS, well, let's talk about 116 for a moment. The uh, waveform is conducted on all this, applicable to all services, I.O. bundles, power leads, including grounds and returns, excluding other wires in the bundle, and power leads, excluding returns and grounds, individual phase leads are tested. It comes out and says it. Not power leads, it says individual. Why would 116 be different? Because this is trying to simulate lightning induced on power cables. So if I've got power cables feeding from the outside world, I don't necessarily get equal things on all phases and the way they distribute. So I don't necessarily have the same events that I did for 115, the, the matter of failure. So here it's an uh, individual phase lead. Submarines, only cables that exit the pressure hull. So basically things that are tied up when it's in port, nothing else gets tested. Limit is 10 amps peak for all applications. The test is accomplished on the lesser of test current or calibrated drive level. Now this is a kind of unique. You've got a calibrated drive level and then the test current is 6 dB higher. In the standard it says that, that as long as it's not 6 dB over. What this really comes down to is I have a 100 ohm calibration jig. I have a loop that's got 50 ohms on this end and 50 ohms on that end, and they're in series. As my cal jig goes through, I come to 50 ohms, back through the base, 
back to here, back to the center. There's my loop. That's 250 ohm terminators in series, that's 100 ohms. So 100 ohms versus the 50 ohm calibration. You calibrate with 100 ohms, you test 60 dB higher, which accounts for a 50 ohm conversion. 60 dB is half, uh, excuse me, double, half the impedance gives me a 60 dB gain in current. So I account for that in the CS116. It says to do it. 115, you don't, okay? So we do that. The test is accomplished with the power on. Those people that are used to the old standard 461E, you had to do a power off and a power on. F says power on, okay? So it's half your test time went away. There was an impedance change at certain places. Depending on the circuit, if you had like uh, receiver drivers, RS-232 system, the impedance characteristic of the chip would be different when it was on and off. So you'd push more current or higher voltage and you couldn't produce current when it was off, so you'd blow out the chip. Okay, so you're looking for damage. Damage, thanks, okay. okay? So it was always an issue. So they saw that this was a potential put it in. 461F says in their theory, it says we've never experienced it. They have no record of experiencing it. Well, how do they know? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it failed when the power was off and I turned it on and it was dead. Okay, would I have had the same failure with it on? I don't know that. But apparently enough people wrote in and says we don't see it and the consensus was power on's adequate test. Okay, so anyway, it got pulled out. We don't complain. Uh, you have the waveform, which is a 10 amp pink. Here's the basic currents that are involved. So you can see it's a 20 log function going on here of the, the slope line. And we come back to three amps at 100 meg. So between one and 30 meg is 10 amps of injected current. 461G is being discussed to add lightning strike much stronger, okay? More like DL160 work. So that's in, in discussion, okay? It's not out there, so if a lab tells you they do the test to G, they don't even know what it is, so they're lying. And I saw help me, I've had that happen already. A client called in and says, I need a test to G. And I says, it's not published. It's not even draft. Well, this lab tested it for us. I said, how can they? They don't know what it says. So, and you need to verify the waveform parameters that your dampening system is there. Looks much like a CS115 calibration, does it? Except I just changed to a dampened sign generator. Right, got the dampened sign generator instead of a pulse generator. So we've changed our module to get to that point. We need to hook up our waveform. I set it for 100 megahertz. I have this, I need to inject. And by the way, those that are not familiar, these are high voltage BNCs, okay? Lots, lots of arcing goes on. Now, I've hooked that system up. I need to put the system back together. And I should have everything in place to verify the calibration. So let's see if I do. Okay, I'm seeing the waveform up here. I'm supposed to get to three amps peak. Three amps should be three volts. Yep, that's three amps. Their calibration puts me into that. And, and by the way, that's information out of the records here. So the three volts should verify that to be the case. I have a 50 ohm termination. I don't want to do that. Okay. Notice I saw that ohm sign there. Cleaned it up before I got carried away. The 50 ohm termination is built into the attenuator here. Okay. So that's part of their system. So I verify that I'm going to three volts. Note that I don't quite see it. I got one volt per division. 
and I'm not hitting one, two, three volts. I'm not quite hitting that line. Okay, so that's just how I'm not, I'm not doing the test level with the system I got. So I would need to go back into here, turn it off. And I need to set a new peak voltage. Edit of 3.2, uh, enter, okay. back to all right I'm back to here and I should be able to operate at 3.2 amps and you notice that my adjustment to the current pushed me just above the three volt line for my calibration okay so now I've got the three amps that I'm supposed to have in my cal okay now I've got this dilemma going on I've got the calibration I record this information verify the dampening Okay, so I've got my, my setup, so I verify the waveforms, the dampening factors, etc. record all the data, the waveform's right. Now comes time to do the test. Well, I'm going to do the same thing I did with CS115, except 115 says do the pre-calibrated current. This says the lesser of. All right, so I need to know where I'm going. I'm trying to go to three amps. By the way, I was wrong in that uh, 6 dB. That's applicable to CS114, not 116. We don't adjust here, okay? 114, you test 6 dB higher than the test current, the calibrated current. So now, I've, once I've verified this and I'm satisfied that everything's in order, I know what my peak should be and I've just set it, I'm ready to go with that. Stop the activity. When we're doing this test, See if I've said the right words. Configure it, use the external 50 ohm, set the generator and repeat and adjust the amplitude, watch for gains and losses and things. Verify the parameter, frequency. By the way, the standard gives you a plus and minus 5% frequency. There is a policy letter out by the committee that says they allow more than that for 116, more tolerance on the frequency. So that's out there, they permit a 10%. The dampening performance, the repetition rate, things like that. You record all the settings for the cal. During the test, it's exactly like 115, except we have the dampened sound generator. We're monitoring the current. Okay. So now I need to go to the lesser of the current. My pre-calibrated said that I set the generator at 3.2. Okay. That's the max I should ever have to hit. But I need to know what current's coming in. So let me switch over. All right, so I bring my system over here. I switch to the monitoring probe to my input. I need 50 ohms now. Okay. So I've got 50 ohms. Looking at that. I need to know where I'm going with this. Okay. At what voltage on my scope will be 3 amps? I need to know that answer. So let's go to the... CS116 spreadsheet, go into our test. The probe factor is zero at 100 meg. Okay, so I'm going to put zero in, and that computes that it's minus 26 dB microvolts, or 94 millivolts on my scope will be three amps, based on that current probe's parameters. Okay, its correction factors and all have been pre-calculated and I'm going to go for 95 milliamps, okay? I mean, 96 millivolts. So when I see 95 millivolts on the scope, I have hit three amps, okay? So let's see what we get, okay? Now, this unit has something called a ramping function. Right now, it's set for go to max, okay? I'm going to go to three amps, period, okay? If it's too much, I could just cut it back. Well, if I've done that and it damages it, you're going to be happy if I damage your unit by going to max right off the bat? 
No, I break his unit and I can't, I can't get it back. Especially when I got a half million dollar tunneling microscope out here that I just break because I didn't think about what I was doing. Okay? The standard says you go to max. The standard doesn't say you adjust until you get there, but it says if you expect high current, adjust slowly till you get there. Well, do I expect high current? Well, if I was driving a shielded cable to a ground system, I'd kind of expect high current. But I don't have any idea what's going to happen with this power grid. Do I have some nice filtering caps that's going to take all that current and shun it on an unshielded power cable? What's going to happen? Is my transformer going to have low intercoupling capacitance and go right to the secondary and hit my circuit, my low voltage circuit? I have no idea what's going to happen here. Okay? So going to IMAX does not make sense to me right off the bat, ever, unless I already know the answer. If I already know the answer, I've done the test. Okay? So it doesn't make any sense for me to drive this thing until I know where I'm going. So right away, I'm going to go back to ramp. Okay? It's got a ramp button I set in here, and I get to edit, and I choose a ramp. And it says I'm going to go from a tenth of the max, which is 0.6 amps, to 3.2. That's where it's set, because I set 3.2 as my max. Okay, during the cal. So it's going to ramp between there, and I'm going to let it take 60 seconds. During that 60 seconds, I'm going to monitor the current that's coming off my current probe. If I get to 94 millivolts, I have hit 3 amps, I stop. How do I stop? Well, it will tell me what the current is on the screen. I hit the stop button as I see the current, and I set that as my new max. Okay? So if I get to 2 volt, 2 on the settings here, and hit the I max, the, the 3 amps, I stop there, set that 2 as my new I max, and then I run it. Here's a dilemma. We're testing for transients, high transients, lots of current, lots of power, lots of energy. When I do this, I'm obligated to sit here with one second pulses for five minutes. When does five minutes start? When I have the threshold established. So if this thing falls when I start going up to here and I get to three amps and it, it starts acting strange, I say, okay, I gotta back it back down and get a new threshold. It's no longer the current, it's some whatever level it took to produce it. So now I set it at 2 amps instead of 3, and it works fine. I set it at 2.2, it doesn't work fine. 2.1 doesn't work fine. I get, okay, 2.1 is my threshold. I restart the test at 2.1 for the five minute test period. Now here's the problem. I've already burned up two minutes getting there. My transorbs, my MOVs, my transient suppressors are now hot. Part of the test is five minutes of heating. Well, I gave them a supercharge for two minutes. They're hot already. And I'm going to give them five more and expect it. And if it fails, it's a legitimate failure. Not really. So I've got to just stop, hold off, cool the things off, get it back to normal. I've got my thresholds established, run the test. So I highly recommend cooling them off. That's something you need to consider. Now, if you got there instantly, probably not a problem. But if you've been a couple of minutes getting there, those things are warm already. So watch for that event. We do this thing and I'm going to ramp it. It says I'm starting my ramp. I need to get a voltage set. I'm trying to get to 100 millivolts. I need a, a trigger someplace on this thing. And I'm not producing any current yet. Here, I'm starting to see the current. And I want to get to 94 millivolts, so I'm near a one, one, one centimeter displacement. Notice that nice waveform, how it's destroyed by this cable. And I'm at 2.1 amps. It's slowly working its way up. It's taking us 60 seconds to get there. And I'm injecting 2.5, and it's this is approaching, this is approaching my level of 94 millivolts. And it's happening right at the same level. So it looks like my circuit here happens to be about the same impedance as my calibration jig. 
So my max here is working as a max there, so I just do my five minutes. And you've got a timer you can set here and it'll count it down. And you do the test, okay? Now we can stop this one and go to a single line and see if it's different. Shall we do that? I'm gonna halt this test. Okay, I'm up to 1.8. We'll see how this plays out here. And by the way, if, it, if it's real close to the level, I'm not gonna pinpoint it. This is highly variable, it really is. Getting this exactly to the 10th, anybody that puts two decimal places here just don't have a clue. Okay? It's not real, okay? So now we're seeing a peak current that's starting to show up right at the level, and I'm at the 3.1, I'm going to 3.2, so this circuit much looks like the other, okay? So depending on various parameters, this is going to happen. I'll guarantee you that flexing the cable makes a difference, okay? That we can pick this cable up. Observe this pulse in particular. And you see it's starting to change by me moving this thing that high. So what's your setups? We're in 100 megahertz. Parasitic things really start bothering issues. Anyway, that's CS116 in a capsule. Okay, 115, 116.